Hello everybody, my name is Deborah Szyjalski and I would uh, like to say that I'm extremely pleased and honored to having received praise Ada Lovelace Award for HPC. And I would like to start this talk with a small tribute to Ada Lovelace herself, who achieved this uh, gigantic mental leap from calculations to computation. And in her, in her own words, the analytic engine may act upon other things besides number, where objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, and which should be also susceptible of adaptions to the action of the operating notation and mechanism of the engine. And I would argue that this quote very nicely encapsulates what we are still trying nowadays to achieve on high performance computing, as well as the next generations of algorithms that we are writing for future architectures and platforms. So starting now with my own work, I want to tell you in this talk a little bit about our plans and ambitions towards exascale simulations of our own universe. So uh, what are we trying to achieve here? Unlike um, the observational astronomers and astrophysicists, who have telescopes in which, which they uh, observe the, the sky, uh, our uh, telescope is actually a high-performance uh, computing facility and our sky is the simulated sky which we, where we try to understand the fundamental laws uh, of nature. So what are the big questions that we are trying to address? Uh, with this approach, uh, really uh, some of the most fundamental questions that you can think of in astrophysics. So how universe formed and evolved, uh, why the universe on very large scales look as it does, how are the galaxies distributed throughout uh, the universe, and what are the galaxies made of, uh, why do we have stars within the galaxies? How are stars born? How do they die? Uh, and also uh, somewhat more uh, exotic questions perhaps that are very pertinent to my own research. Uh, why there are supermassive black holes in our universe and which fundamental relationship do they have with the surroundings, uh, stars and also their host galaxies in which they are embedded in. So why are we trying to do simulations and what they are to answer these key questions? Well, it often occurs that the problem is way too complex to be solved with the traditional, we would say, analytical pen and paper approach. So we would have a set an equation like you might see on this slide here, which at the face value uh, looks manageable, but often uh, these uh, sets of equations which actually des describe the fundamental laws of physics uh, that we uh, want to apply to our universe are way too complex to be uh, solved analytically and they lead also not only to the complex but also non-linear effects and that's why we need uh, supercomputers or high performance computing facilities to be able to solve these sets of equations and to obtain as an end result something that we call a simulated galaxy or a simulated patch of the universe that we can then analyze in great detail. So uh, how can we then simulate the whole universe? Well, to start with, our universe is actually rather strange, even, even though in its infancy it starts uh, rather uh, with the simple uh, initial conditions, as we would told them, so almost uniform density and temperature field described the uh, very early universe very well. Uh, soon it uh, develops into very complex structure and also the composition of the universe is rather strange. So most of the universe uh, as we know it today is what we call dark. Uh, why is that? Because most of the matter in the universe that reacts through gravity is dark, and that is what we call dark matter. Then there is a small component of the matter, which is ordinary matter of baryons, and this is the common, the component that we know uh, relatively well. And then there is a large component, which is called dark energy, that drives the actually the accelerated expansion of the universe itself. So how can we then simulate this all complex universe? Well, actually to uh, have a guess uh, how the universe uh, uh, was in the very early times, we have some observations that are giving us really good and uh, precise initial conditions. 
and then we can evolve uh, the universe as a function of the cosmic time uh, to a first approximation, assuming just that the gravity is the fundamental force that acts. And uh, this is a depiction of uh, this type of calculation, one of the uh, larger simulations when was back then when it was executed, the Millennium Simulation, where you can see the density field of the universe, which initially was rather smooth, but as the time progresses due to the gravity, the structures uh, are bound and collapse together, and the universe becomes more and more clustered and more and more uh, complex. And in this approximation, we neglect any contribution from baryons, that is gas or stars. So uh, this uh, so-called pure dark matter only simulations in our own uh, cosmological uh, model uh, have made a remarkable actually progress over the last 40 years. So what I'm showing you here on the plot is the number of simulation particles versus the publication year of a paper that adopted this particular simulation. And you can see that the very first attempts in 1970, uh, uh, how they look like uh, on the top. And you can see that nowadays we are entering the regime where we are simulating a patch of the universe with actually 8 trillion resolution elements or particles as we call it. And one example of one of these such ambitious simulations is shown uh, on the bottom and you can see what is the extraordinary dynamic range and complexity of the universe and of the structure formation that we can capture with this simulation nowadays, which are obviously all performed on the HPC facilities. So, uh, unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Uh, so, the, uh, if you look at night, at the starry night, and if you're lucky enough to have a, a, a lovely view like this, uh, what you see is actually not dark matter, which is dominating the, the ma total matter contribution of the universe, as I told you before, but it's actually gas and stars. And if we uh, just estimate in our own galaxy the Milky Way, uh, we uh, come to a number that there are more than 10 to the 68 hydrogen atoms. Uh, in our own galaxy, and in the observable universe, probably there are around 10 to the 80 or more hydrogen atoms. So these numbers are really huge. So we have to somehow try to simulate this component that we clearly see on our observable skies, but that is extremely complex and that is represented by su such a large number of, number of individual particles. So obviously, what we have to assume here is some discretization approximation to uh, be able to reduce this number to something uh, that we can simulate of order of 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 resolution elements. There is, however, another large complexity that is involved here, and this is not just to do uh, to the sheer numbers. Uh, in, uh, in resolution elements, there is also a vast range of spatial scales that we have to incorporate. So let me illustrate this in this slide here. So what we want to simulate when we uh, think about the universe is actually a representative patch of the universe, uh, which is fairly large. So we are talking of order of 10 to the 9 parsecs. But within this patch, we want to actually simulate individual galaxies themselves that have some characteristic size of order of 10 to the 3 parsecs. But to understand how the galaxies form in the very first place in this large patch of the universe, we have to actually simulate on the fly, so consistently, also the components of the galaxies themselves. And this brings us again uh, to an order of two mag orders of magnitude smaller scales. Finally, we all know, uh, also from this picture of the starry night, that galaxies are all made up of stars, and we want to understand how these stars form and evolve within individual galaxies, and how actually do they build them up. So this brings us down again further to an order of 0.1 uh, parsecs in the case of the massive stars, or even to much smaller case, uh, smaller scales, if we, for example, want to understand the winds from uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, massive stars. So then we have to understand the scales of order of 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 6 parsecs. And finally, there is a um, 
firm observational evidence that there are supermassive black holes in the course of massive galaxies, but perhaps actually in the course of majority of the galaxies in our universe. And if we want to understand the physics related with supermassive black holes in the course of these galaxies, the scales become also much smaller. So we are talking of the scales below 10 to the minus 6 parsecs. So you can see that the dynamical range of scales is enormous here. And we ideally would like to simulate that all in one go. So this is currently computationally uh, impossible to do. Uh, and uh, so we would have to, <laughs> we will have to wait quite some time to be able to tackle more and more of important physical scales in our computations. But it's not just the single scales, a bunch of complex physical processes occur on these different scales. And given that these scales are mutually linked to each other and are talking to each other, and the physics depends, the physics on, let's say, on some smaller scales depends on the physics which is happening on smaller scales, we have this very complex nonlinear interplay of physics on mutual scales. And this makes this problem really computationally and physically challenging to solve uh, in one go. So, how are we trying to uh, do this? Actually, we take our fundamental equations, which we think are governing the physical nature of the, of the galaxies and the universe and the structures they form within, and we try to uh, discretize this set of equations uh, in different hydrodynamical codes that uh, may be uh, based on particles, so uh, in a Lagrangian approach, may take a complex adaptive mesh refinement meshes to be able to solve these sets of equations or may take advantage of unstructured uh, moving meshes. So there are different ways how we can solve these equations and there are different advantages and disadvantages in these methods uh, trying to uh, capture the physics exact, exactly as possible. So I wanted to show you a really uh, short movie illustrating this vast range of scales and the complexity of physics that we are trying to address in these types of simulations. So uh, this movie here is, has been taken from the Illustri simulation and is one of the uh, larger simulations uh, of uh, galaxy formation that has been executed today. And you can see here the view of the universe at very early cosmic times, where you can see the formation of the very first objects, so the first stars, the first galaxies. And then as these objects form, the matter is condensed into these little knots, which are the galaxies, and they lie at the intersection of larger structures, which we call the cosmic web or the filaments, large-scale filaments, through which the matter and the galaxies stream and they accrete towards these knots where larger and larger objects are uh, created. And uh, in this process also star formation is triggered and also the accretion of the matter onto supermassive black hole happens and then matter can be violently also expelled away from the center of the galaxies and actually into the intergalactic medium, the space between the galaxies due to the action of the supernovae uh, explosions or the uh, uh, very powerful explosions from uh, creating supermassive black holes. So I wanted to tell you a little bit what is the current state of the art in this type of cosmological simulations that try to incorporate not just dark matter, but also the properties of gas and stars and star formation and gas cooling and black hole accretion and uh, all of these. So typically the dynamical range is uh, relatively large, but nothing compared to what we really would uh, like to get on, uh, to in the future. So we are talking about uh, perhaps a sub kiloparsec scales to the scales of order of 100 megaparsecs. These simulations typically are running on uh, 10,000 and more CPU times, so the codes are really uh, very well parallelized. Typical simulation, a single, just single simulation, will take somewhere of order of 10 to 15 million CPU hours, and it generates of order of petabytes and petabytes of data that we have to then analyze to understand uh, what is happening. 
And again, similarly to the previous types of calculations, so I'm showing you here the number of resolution elements uh, as a function of the publication year, and you can see how much progress has been made in the field and where we stand. And uh, some of these red points at the end of the diagram uh, correspond to this uh, illustri simulation, which I showed you uh, just a second ago. So, uh, what are actually the main success stories of these uh, simulations? So, one of them is uh, our finally ability to reproduce the galaxies as we see them in the observed universe. So, here I'm showing you a result where on one side on, uh, of the plot is the real observed universe uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, and on the other side, it's our simulated or mock universe, and you can see that they really uh, look alike. So this is one of the successes of this uh, type of simulations, and uh, I can show you another more kind of uh, perhaps uh, concrete example, and this is the has been a long-standing problem in the field for 20 years or more. This is to reproduce the morphological diversity of galaxies. So there is something which is very well known in the field, which is called the Hubble uh, tuning fork or the Hubble diagram, mm -hmm. where the galaxies from when people first started observing them have been classified in some categories. And there are galaxies that look uh, spherical, roundish, and they are called ellipticals, and they are galaxies that have a clear disk structure and perhaps the spiral arms or the bars in the center, and like our own uh, Milky Way galaxy, and then there are ga galaxies with really irregular uh, massive morphologies. And uh, up to recently, uh, this morphological diversity of galaxies, which is so well known in the observed galaxies, was not reproduced in any simulation results. So it was the illustrious and a couple of other simulations that came about in 2014 and onwards that were able for the first time to reproduce this morphological diversity of galaxies and actually to find the reason why this morphologi morphological diversity exists in the first place. And this comes from the presence actually of these supermassive black holes in the course of the galaxies. So this is a little bit of a messy plot, so I won't enter into details, but we know that there is a correlation between the mass of the supermassive black hole that is sitting in the center of the galaxy against the stellar mass of its host galaxy. So the most massive, the stellar mass of the ga galaxy, the more massive black hole is sitting at the center of the galaxy. And then you can start to see what is the morphology of the galaxy that is populating these different regions of the central diagram. And you find a very strong cor correlation for the galaxies that host the most massive black holes, their morphologies transition from what we call the disk dominated systems into the spheroidal elliptical galaxies. And we think the energy input from these supermassive black holes is actually the key ingredient that causes this morphological transformation. Okay, so let me now, in the last part of the talk, uh, guide you to some more recent developments, uh, what, uh, where the field is moving and what we have been working on. So one is a new uh, algorithmic development that together with my uh, former PhD student, Mike Curtis, I have been doing uh, several years ago. And this is to try to zoom in into the central regions of the galaxies where these supermassive black holes reside and to increase mass and spatial resolution there by many orders of magnitude to be able to capture the physical processes that happen in the central region much more accurately. Actually, if you remember this diagram of many different scales that happen is to try to make a bridge between some of these scales. So I want to show you a small video how this looks like. So this is a simulated galaxy and this mesh that you see on top, it's actually the computational domain and you can see how that is resolved with individual cells. So now, as the time progresses, we are zooming in the center of the galaxies, but at the same time, the mesh is refining more and more in the central region to uh, actually add this added uh, dynamical resolution in mass and space. And you can see that also on the 
plots on the side. So in, in the top plot, you have the whole simulated galaxy, then you have to zoom in towards the central bar-like region, and then you have a zoom in all the way to the center, where you can see how many resolution elements we actually have added there. So what we can do with this approach of adding mass and spatial resolution. So one obvious application is that we can study jets. So these are collimated high velocity outflows, which are la launched from supermassive black holes, which are accreting, which we call active galactic nuclei. And I'm showing you an example where on the top you can see in the panels, in the two panels, you can see if you don't uh, uh, resolve the relevant scales, you actually cannot generate a jet, but only if you start resolving these very small scales, you can start essentially generating jet cell consistently in these simulations. And on the bottom plot, you can see that these jets are now resolved uh, with exquisite resolution in our simulations, and one can study many different properties of these jets, including the velocity field, the temperature, the density, vorticity, turbulence, and so on and so forth. So why is this important? When, uh, in essence, we can now compare these jet uh, simulations uh, with real observations. And this is what we have recently done uh, in a letter where we have done a full cosmological simulation, simulating, a, again, a significant chunk of the universe and a very massive object that form in the center of our simulated domain, which we call the galaxy cluster. And then in the central region of this galaxy cluster, we actually can zoom in. So there is this tiny yellow rectangle, which I guess you cannot even see. And if you zoom in there, then you can see the picture. Actually, what is happening there is the picture of the jet that is shown with these green colors. And this is this jet that has been launched, achieving this very high resolution in the central region. And then what we can study is actually in detail the properties of the jet. So we can zoom in even further and you can see some of this in the bottom plots. And you can actually see the exquisite resolution with which we resolve the individual regions of the jet and we can study the turbulence uh, in the jet itself and the energy transport from the jet to the surrounding medium, which could be an important heating source of these objects, the galaxy clusters. So uh, what we can do with these simulations, we can try to do images of our simulations that look uh, something like observation, so we can try to process them in the same way, and that we call the mock uh, observation. So in one panel, again, is the real observation of a, such a jet in an observed system, and the other one is our attempt to model this. So we are, again, with this new algorithmic developments coming close of uh, resolving these jet structures with a great level of realism. So let me conclude this talk uh, with uh, a little bit outlook on the future. So obviously, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. And uh, high performance computing, if anything, its importance is going to increase in future. So our ultimate goal is to bridge the scales from really large scales of the universe down to the scales of galaxies all the way down to the scales of accretion disks around supermassive black holes and even the processes such as merging of supermassive black holes. And we want to do all of that in a single simulation and this is where uh, the field uh, will be moving. So thank you very much for your attention.